This is the 10 Car and Angler Level Line Podcast, your home for smart discussion about 10 Cara and other forms of fixed line fly fishing. Welcome to the 10 Car Angler Level Line Podcast. My name is Mike Agnetta, Senior Editor of 10 Car Angler. Uh, I'm being joined today once again by a co host, uh, fellow editor, Matt Smith. How's it going, Matt? Great. Great to be here. I'm, I, I don't know today's guest very well, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, <laughs> you know, hear, hearing some background about this stranger. Yeah, so uh, what, what uh, Matt's kind of alluding to is uh, I guess we're getting the Badger Tankara gang back together again. Um, our guest yeah. on today's episode is one of the co-founders of uh, Badger Tankara, uh, Mike Lutz. Um, so, hey, Mike, how's it going? Great. Thanks for uh, inviting me on the podcast. I feel like a Tenkara nobody these days, so I was rather honored. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons yeah, why I think we wanted to have you on. I think that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on. Um, you know, you've you've straddled the line of being kind of in the industry and out of the industry. And, um, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to talk to somebody who, you know, doesn't really have skin in the game uh, at this point and just, you know, fishes Tenkara for, for pleasure. So Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, the way we typically kick these off is just kind of asking our guests to introduce themselves. So I, I don't know if you want to give a little bit of background on uh, who you are, maybe you know, what your profession is, um, and you know how you got into Tenkara. Sure. Yeah. So um, I am Mike Lutz. Obviously, um, I am a uh, almost lifelong friend of Matt Smet. We've known each other since we were five. Yeah. Uh, professionally, I'm a practicing emergency physician, um, so that's what I do for a living. Uh, I'm a father of five, uh, so I've kind of a full house on top of all that, too. I've been married to my wife, Natasha, for almost 20 years, um, and we're sending our first off to college this week, so kind of big times around here. Wow. Um, I got into Tenkara. I was one of, I, I was an early-ish uh, adopter of Tenkara. I, I don't remember exactly when. I know it wasn't in year one, um, but it was either in year year two, either year two or year three that it was kind of popularized in the U.S. I think I started getting into it around 2010. Gotcha. Um, Do you remember your first rod? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my first rod was a, a TUSA because it, back then it was Chris Stewart or TUSA. So there weren't, weren't a lot of options on the market. Um, I don't remember which model it was. I have since sold that a long time ago. Um, but yeah, I, uh, it was it was interesting confluence of events. I um, had been in practice uh, for about five or six years. Um, I was working an academic medical job. I was working at an academic medical center, so I worked almost full time clinically in the emergency department. Um, I had an administrative job. And then I was also teaching residents and medical students. And then eventually I was also teaching continuing medical education um, for physicians. And then I was also doing a little bit of um, academic research and writing. Not a lot, but a little bit of that on the side. So and you were I, kind of slacking, you know, yeah. just kind of like laying back and not getting much done. It, it was a bit much. And yeah. when my wife came to me and said, you know, we have to do something different. And we had three young kids at home and I was just way too consumed with work. So actually left that job and moved from, we were in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and moved from Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, that was in 2009. And I had always been sort of a casual fisherman. Um, but that move, going from working that much to working a straight clinical job, just freed up a lot of space in my life. And I had always wanted to fly fish. And uh, I met a couple guys from the neighborhood who fly fished and kind of fell in with them. And the rest is history. Got it. So you were a gear fisherman when you were casually fishing to start? Yeah, with? pretty much. Dunking worms. I mean, I don't, yeah. Uh, I, I was not a sophisticated fisherman by any means. It was sort of like a relaxing thing to do occasionally in the summer. I mean, I was not serious about it at all. And then um, the way that this job shaped out, I live in the Madison area, but I commute, you know, 40, 45 miles out to work at rural hospitals. Okay. And it turns out there's a lot of trout streams between here and where I go to work. And so I would, you know, get off of work and I would fish for an hour or two, or, you know, if I had a 7 and 8 a.m. shift and it was the height of summer, sometimes I'd get up at four in the morning, go fish the creek for an hour and go into work. Um, so I was able to create space in my life to get a lot of fishing in. So I felt like I did several years worth of fishing in those first couple of years of getting into fly fishing. 
Got it. Got it. So you, you did pick up a fly fishing, you know, rod and reel, I guess, to start. And then mm-hmm. eventually that, I guess, turned into Tenkara at some point. What, yep. was, what was the impetus for that, for that change? Well, I really sucked at fly fishing. Like Matt knows, like we, you know, we grew no, up in where kids actually just played pickup sports outside. And I was literally like the last kid picked, like the yeah. coordination, that sort of thing. I was, I was almost always the last or next to last kid picked. So I was not a natural at fly fishing. I had a pretty rough learning curve. And um, it was frustrating because a lot of the people that I fished around were fishing like with indicators and dropper rigs. And I was just like, this is kind of complicated. Like this isn't, I like to fish dry flies and I would occasionally fish streamers, but like the guys who would fish that way were catching more fish. And I just thought it doesn't really appeal to me. And then I saw somewhere an article about Tenkara and, you know, everyone thinks of Wisconsin fishing, you think of the driftless, um, but there is a region called the which are basically old worn down mountains and they have uh, steeper gradient creeks. So it's more like a mountain creek. And so I saw Tenkara and I thought, well, that would work here. And so I tried that and just immediately fell in love. I mean, it was life changing for me to pick up a Tenkara rod and I've basically never looked back. I have a bunch of fly rods that collect dust. Uh, editor's note, uh, we will be bleeping out the name of the region, uh, <laughs> much to the frustration of, of everybody listening, but, uh, the, the, yeah, the, yeah, that's, that's, I top, that secret stuff, enough, but <laughs> that's top secret stuff, man. Beep. That's too funny. So, I mean, I guess before we get into the point where I guess you and uh, Matt, you know, jumped in and, and started Badger, because um, yeah. I remember there was a, you know, national progression or natural progression once you got into Tankara. I'm curious, you know, what sort of local waters do you fish today? You, know, you said you live in Wisconsin. There's obviously a lot of different ways of fishing. What kind of, what do you use your Tankara rods for? Yeah, so... What I do now is, um, you know, we're, th- we're, we're blessed to have a pretty long trout season um, in Wisconsin. It opens in January and then it goes, I believe, till the second week of October. So we can fish trout almost year round. So in the winter, um, I will fish for trout uh, because the streams are, you know, the streams are open. They're spring fed. You can still fish. So if it's a nice day and I have the day off, I will go fish for trout. And I will generally do that on the driftless creeks because the higher gradient creeks are frozen. Like they're, they're runoff creeks and they just freeze. So you can't really fish those in the winter. And then, um, so, you know, March and April are kind of my big trout fishing months. And then once May hits, I fish smallmouth. And I will fish almost exclusively for smallmouth until September or October. I start to transition back and fish a little bit more trout until the trout season closes. Got it. How, how does your gear differ from when you're fishing for trout versus smallmouth? Um, so, yeah, I do. Well, I don't, I'm not super particular about gear. Um, you know, my sort of, my sort of one fly equivalent is I use whatever rod is currently rigged. Um, so whatever rod is like in my car and ready to go, like that's the one I grab and I like fish it. Um, so, and you know, I just, I use a lot of rods interchangeably. Now, obviously if I'm on big water for smallmouth bass, I use a dedicated rod for that. I use the Wisco two is my go-to rod. I was just out last week with a buddy and that's what I used. But if I'm fishing creeks, I, I kind of fish whatever. Um, so, you know, I do, I, in the last few years, I've, I've kind of diverged a little bit on that. Um, if I am fishing more for trout, I will tend to use, um, uh, I bought from Tom Davis, who runs Teton Tenkara. He had a demo um, Tenkara Times rod that he was trying to give to a newbie for like $15, and nobody bought it. So I bought that thing for $15, and I fished, you know, I fished the snot out of that rod for the last two years for trout. Um, so that tends to be my go-to. And then when I'm fishing for smallmouth, I use one of the badger rods. And just a side note, on those Tenkara Times rods, those are great rods. I think they're really good for what they are and for the value they don't i don't think they have a really good following here in the united states because they're manufactured overseas but if they were had a different paint job and had a different name on it Mm -hmm. you know i think they'd be killer rods it's funny that you mentioned that yeah no i i got got a hold of that rod and first of all i couldn't believe that he was selling it for 15 bucks and then secondly i got a hold of it i couldn't believe how much i liked it and it kind of became my go-to rod 
So, and I will fish that over some of my nicer Japanese rods. Very when you have a rod that works for you, that you, you just feel the balance right and everything's yep. smooth, and that consistency and that familiarity is is uh, you know it, it, a good trade off for quote unquote performance sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, it's whatever you're most comfortable with, whatever, you know, you can kind of understand and become one with, I guess, is sort of the woohoo way to say it. I, I guess you, you're a man of many rods. Um, would you consider yourself having a particular Tenkara style or is it just pretty much anything goes? Yeah, I am kind of an anything goes. I mean, when I fish um, for trout, I am mostly fishing with level line but I'm, I typically use weighted nymphs. Um, you know, in the driftless creeks, you can certainly catch fish, fishing traditional Japanese style with kabari. I have more luck with a nymph. Um, and I like to, it, it's what makes me happy. And so that, that's what I do. So, and then if I'm fishing for um, warm water species, I'm usually fishing with a floating line and some sort of, of streamer uh, appropriate to the size of the rod. So what would you, uh what would you speak to as to the difference between streamer fishing with Tenkara rods and streamer fishing with uh, conventional rods? Which, which do you feel you have uh, more uh, possibilities with or what, what differences have you noticed in, in, in any sort of contrast there? Sure. So I guess, you know, maybe we need to be clear here so that we don't make the Tenkara purist angry. Obviously, fishing for smallmouth with floating line as streamer is not really Tenkara, but that's way easier to say than fixed line fly fishing. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> I like it better because um, it is... So first of all, the only real advantage that a, a traditional fly rod, a Western-style fly rod, has over Tenkara for that style of fishing is range. And I don't really ever feel that I, you know, I, I'm, I don't have adequate range. If you're, you know, if you have mm -hmm. your skill is up to it, up to par, you don't necessarily need that range. And I actually feel like in a lot of circumstances, because of the tight line nature of Tenkara, I can control a streamer a little better than I can with a traditional fly rod. The only time you get a little bit hosed is like if um, you're in a boat and you're close to the boat um, and you're pulling that fly in and you have a fish that's following it. Um, you know, sometimes you kind of run out of run out of room to really keep a tight line and manipulate the fly. But I mean, that's such a rare circumstance. And the other thing that I think is awesome about fishing, um, you know, fishing streamers with a long tenkara rod. Um, is that you can just hit pockets so fast. Like if you're, if you're drifting in a boat down a river, you can just nail a pocket, nail a pocket, nail a pocket, nail a pocket. Because you're not playing line in and out. You're not false casting. You're mm -hmm. just picking it up, hitting a hot spot, you know, twitching it back a few times. If nothing goes for it, you're hitting the next spot. And it's, it's super engaging. And you can just get engrossed in this hitting spot after spot after spot. And I can do that a lot faster than I can with a traditional fly rod. I feel like I keep answering all your questions tangentially, but that's probably how this is going to go. <laughs> There's a great example of what Mike's talking about uh, in one of the uh, the Badger Tinkara uh, YouTube channel videos uh, of, of Mike actually down in Costa Rica fishing for machaca. Uh, and essentially, you can see the way he's working the bank and, you know, he launch a cast out, drift it for four or five seconds, pick it back up. And, you know, he's, he's getting four or five casts every every 20, 30 seconds and really work in the water and able to prospect at a, at a speed and spread of location that I would really challenge anyone with a conventional rod to be able to keep up with. You but, would have to be a really slick fly caster to, to hit as many pockets as you can with a 10 car rod. So can we talk about the machaca a little bit more? I mean, that's something that you don't hear anybody. Yeah. Really talk about. Yeah. That's the story behind that. that are interesting. There's a guy that lives in Costa Rica um, who's originally from Guyana, who speaks like seven or eight languages, who's been a fly fisherman all his life and has guided, you know, some of the greats in fly fishing. And uh, we were just making a trip, a family trip down to Costa Rica. And, you know, my wife said, well, why don't you see if you can fish? And there's not a lot of fly fishing guides in Costa Rica. So I asked this guy and I said, by the way, do you care if I uh, take uh, a Tenkara rod. He's like, I would love that. I would love to try that on Machaca. 
And the best way that I can describe machaca are um, they have a carp-like body, they fight like a small mouth, and they only want surface flies. Um, so they're, they're pretty awesome as far as, they're not even officially classified as a game fish and whatever the IDG, I don't even know what it's called. Um, but they're not classified as a game fish, but they are, they are super aggressive feeders. And what they do is they feed on the fruit that falls in the river along these um, jungle rivers, uh, rainforest rivers. And so they're very attracted to the surface. So you're casting these flies that look like berries, basically. And they have very sharp teeth. They have almost like piranha-like teeth. Oh, and so they're not sucking the fly down like a bass. They're biting the fly. And so you really have to have your timing on. As soon as they bite, you got to set. So it's actually really tricky to... They're very aggressive feeders, but it's really tricky to hook up with them. Got it. Do they... Yeah. Um, do, do people eat them there? Or is it... I know you said it wasn't a game fish. Right. No, I would assume so. Like the only people we saw on that trip when we're floating down the rainforest on this boat is, um, you know, locals who were presumably fishing for the dinner table. Those were the only other people we saw. Um, but it's not really a well-developed sport fishery. Sure. Sure. So I, I, you may be the first, I guess, maybe North American to have fished for those with a fixed line rod. Does that sound correct? I think I am uh, because Peter, the guide, I don't think he had even fished for Machaca with a Tenkara rod, even though he owned a Tenkara rod. They have mountains in Costa Rica and at some point rainbow trout got introduced yeah. in the mountains and they thrive there. So he was, had, um, was doing um, some mountain fishing for trout there, but had not tried a uh, Tenkara rod for the Machaca, if I remember correctly. That's awesome. Field Sounds trip. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like a, a lot, a lot of fun. If you get the opportunity, I mean, you know, there. If you were, if you wanted to do like a, you know, mountain fishing for trout in Costa Rica, and then a float for Machaca, you know, that would that would be a pretty awesome, awesome trip. And they really are an exciting fish, and you know, they feed very aggressively on the surface. And I'll never forget. At one point, there were these holler monkeys up in the tree and they were fighting and they were knocking all this fruit into the water. And then the fish were just going crazy and, <laughs> and I'm tapping into that boiling fish as fast as I can and missing most of the hookups because they're so fast, but it was, I've never done anything quite like that. That sounds amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. And I'm not like a big travel fisherman, like, you know, 98% or 99% of my fishing is here in Wisconsin. So I'm not like a big destination fisherman, but I really, I really did enjoy that trip. Awesome. Awesome. Do you mind if I rewind the conversation just real quick? You know, you, you mentioned when you were talking about your, your smallmouth fishing and then, you know, the machaca as well, that you, you fish, you use boats uh, quite a bit, which is something mm -hmm. that you don't hear really a lot about when it comes to Tenkara. What is your typical, are you a kayak guy, a canoe guy? How, what, what does that look like? Yeah. So, um, uh, all the above. Um, so, um, when I fish the Wisconsin river, um, I have fished the Wisconsin, which is a, a big river that flows uh, about 25, 30 minutes north of here. It is a great smallmouth fishery. Oh, yeah. um, I have fished that in a canoe, in a drift boat, and then I have gone out with a guide and also with a friend who has a jet boat, um, which because the water gets so low, low you can't have a regular prop. Um, so I fished from all of those. And then, you know, I also have uh, a fish from a kayak, I'll fish from a canoe, I'll fish from a float tube fish from a stand-up paddleboard. Like I just like, I like in general human powered watercraft and I like fishing with, you know, Tenkara rods from human powered watercraft. Got it. Got it. Are there any Even special, <laughs> special considerations you have to, you have to take when you're, you know, say in a kayak or canoe and you obviously have to manage the oars or paddles or whatever at the same time as your, your rod. Yeah. So that's kind of the downside is, um, you know, you have a 14 foot Tenkara rod and then you need to paddle what do you do with it? And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just stick it out the back and, and just kind of let it troll behind me. And, you know, I will occasionally pick up a fish that way. Not very often, more often I will hook on something and have to turn around and get my rod. Um, <laughs> but otherwise you just, I mean, you know, that's the beauty of it, right? I mean, you just collapse it and stick it in your pack or stick it in the boat and then paddle on. So, and you know, if I'm out on my, my paddle board, um, I can, you know, kind of stabilize the paddleboard in one hand and then fish with the other. Um, so it's it's a little awkward, but, you know, it can be done um, as long as you don't have too much wind. Got it. 
Awesome. Well, maybe let's pivot to, um, I guess, the the genesis story of uh, Badger 10 Car. I, I'm fortunate to have both co-founders yeah. um, on the line right now. Um, I yeah. don't know who, who wants to take the lead here. If you want to do it, Mike and Matt, feel free to jump in. But I uh, would love to hear a little bit ha- about a little bit more on how you guys decided to start that as a as a business. Sure. Well, I think it's kind of a good origin story, and I'm sure Matt has his version of it, which may differ slightly from my version, but um, Matt and I, like I said, have known each other forever. We actually met in kindergarten. Um, We were five years old, and the first week of kindergarten, Matt and I got sent to the principal's office together, which would not be the last time we got sent to the principal's office together. It definitely Um, set the tone for the first half dozen years. (laughs) And uh, so then first grade, um, my, my parents had divorced like a year, year and a half before. And we, uh, my mom and stepdad moved into a new house. So I was in a new school. And so, you know, Matt and I were no longer in school together. And then in second grade, um, Matt's parents moved to the same side of town and we ended up in class together again. And so we were like reunited and then we were, we were best friends growing up. We had this group of four of us that, uh, I mean, it was like stranger things without all the paranormal stuff. I mean, we just yeah. rode our bikes all over creation, played D and D in the basement. Mm-hmm. And then when we got a little older, we were, you know, walking around the mall looking for girls like that. That was, that's a pretty good representation of our childhood. And then, um, you know, after after high school, Matt and I kind of went our separate ways, um, didn't really stay in touch very well. And then by the magic of social media, I got back in touch. It was probably 2008 or 2009. And uh, lo and behold, we had both landed in Madison, Wisconsin. We grew up in Rockford, Illinois. So Madison, Wisconsin is like 70, 80 miles north of that. But we had both ended up in the same town and reconnected. And we both loved the outdoors. Um, neither one of us had parents that really did outdoorsy stuff. Um, so we were in scouts together and that was responsible for a lot of our love of the outdoors. And so once we kind of reconnected, we started hiking together. Um, you know, I used to hunt a lot, so we would hunt together a little bit. And then um, one time I was like, Matt, why don't we try, you know, Tenkara fishing. This has been really fun. And we did it. And Matt was hooked the first day. Uh, oh, yeah. that, uh, loved it. And then we were driving home from a fishing trip and uh, we were just talking and we're like, maybe we should start a business. Maybe we should, maybe this would be a fun project. So does that kind of jive? That was very long winded. Yeah. I, I mean, that, 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 that's about it. You know, I think we we were fishing probably about six to eight months uh, before we 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 discussed the business idea and and I think a, a large driver behind that was that we were excited about Tinkara rod fishing and wanted to share it with people and had yeah. been had kind of sensed what we saw as some barriers to people being able to get into it, which yep. is why we decided uh, let's just try to get some cheap. I don't want to say cheap, affordable because affordable. I don't believe our rods yeah. were were cheap. Some right. affordable rods out there. And, uh, you know, it just so happened that, that I was kind of transitioning out of my, uh, my government contracting and training career at the time. And uh, we just kind of stumbled into it. I think it only took us a couple of weeks to find a distributor. And we had, you know, uh, the first uh, prototypes on the way to us. And, you know, I, 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 I've been told that we are uh, evil capitalists who uh, wanted to squeeze the soul out of uh, not only Tinkara, but just like the nation of Japan in general, uh, by, by some people. Uh, but uh, the truth is we're, you know, pretty much stumbled into it and then uh, we're surprised that it actually kind of took off. And then I was like, whoa, I better do something with this. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Our <laughs> name was actually Access Tenkara, which we threw out because it wasn't a great name. But that was really the kind of the idea is we just wanted to get people into it. And, you know, what we kind of said is, you know, we don't want to sell the Ferrari of rods. We want to sell the Honda Accord. You know, we just want to sell an affordable, reliable rod that will do all the things that you need it to do. And I think I think we succeeded in that. I mean, I think the rods we produce, I still fish with to this day, and I still love uh, because they're just well-made rods, and they're not going to be quite as fine and quite as light as a really nice Japanese rod, but you can fish with one of our rods for a long time with no hassle. No doubt. Yeah, I, I was I was happy, Mike, with uh, 
uh, I, I felt, you know, that we were really able to kind of facilitate whatever people wanted to do with their rods. Yeah. Uh, and a big part of that was just the way you and I are like, you know, as, so as soon as we started to get slightly comfortable with trout, you know, we looked at each other. We were like, what else can we do with these, man? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and Mike's actually, you know, uh, throughout our fishing career, you know, he, he's done a lot of experimenting with, uh, with like, custom line building and stuff. And, and uh, Mike really actually, you know, he talks about wanting to keep it simple, but he sometimes goes way down the rabbit hole. I remember some, yeah. like, eight-segment lines and uh, <laughs> stuff that you were, you know, busting out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, if, there, if, if you if, if there's a line out there, I've tried it or messed with it. So, it. Um, and what I've settled on has been the result of an awful lot of experimentation, some of which did not work well at all. <laughs> Do you have any horror <laughs> stories to tell? Well, no, I'm you know I, I fish in all weather, and I used to really like um, some of the braided lines, but you know those freeze. <laughs> <laughs> You can't fish with them in Wisconsin in the shoulder season. It's a little freeze. Ew. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that just didn't cast worth a darn or it casts okay, but you can't see it because it's too mm -hmm. thin. Like, and I'm not that old, but some of this stuff I just can't see. Um, so that's a factor. So that's that's why I've settled on the lines that I use because they work for me and I can see them. <laughs> Got it. Makes a lot of sense. I, I think the first time I met both of you guys, uh, I came out to Wisconsin. Uh, to yeah, the all the way from the, Florida. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, for the uh, for one of the Midwest Tenkara fests. Um, you guys did a great job activating uh, you know, the local community, um, like Thank you said, guys. Said you know, getting them, getting giving them access to Tenkara, and um, you know, allowing them to kind of learn, you know, something that they might not normally be able to, you know, see in 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 first person. Um, I'm just curious, do you have any fond uh, memories of those fests or about the Ten Car community in general uh, with, with your face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with people? Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Oh, uh, yeah, I was, I, was, I was hoping you'd lead. But oh, yeah, okay. like, I, I, honestly, the vast majority of, of all of the events, uh, I love the way that uh, very quickly the camping aspect turned into its own thing uh, and became kind of like uh, it's its own event. And, and since, unfortunately, having to discontinue the event has gone on. Unfortunately, you know, this year there's been some weird circumstances and I'm, I'm not certain that the event's going to go on. But I know the intent in the future uh, is to continue to bring anglers together and to introduce them to the Driftless, which the more and more the, uh, fishing I do all over North America, I'm still... You know, it, it's it's still like one of it, it's a special place. It's a unique fishery that you'll just not find that experience much anywhere else. So being able to share that, but just so much of the the the, the time spent with people and meeting, uh, you know, met Mike there for the first time, and uh, the first time I met Daniel in person was you know when he came to one of our events, and it, it just served. Uh, for me, uh, not only on, in the professional aspect of it, but just in the community aspect of it, is such a great bridge for bringing people together. That uh, that's that's what I love most about it. Yeah, and and to Matt's credit, I mean, you know, when we were running Badger Tenkara, Matt was all about outreach. Um, you know, to uh, community groups, to the veterans, to the Boy Scouts. Um, you know, I did some stuff with a. Uh, uh, local alternative school, helping kids get into fly fishing. Like we, we were just always about helping people, um, you know, introducing people into Tinkara, not because we wanted to sell them rods, because, but because we wanted other people to enjoy it as much as we did and get the satisfaction from it that, that we did. That's the awesome. selling was important too. But <laughs> well, would have been nice to have it off. But we, you know, cultivate those customers. I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. What it, yeah. Comes, yeah, what it comes down to. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned it in, in your opening remarks that you have a five kids. Do I have that right? Correct. Do they do they fish with ten car rods or fixed line rods? All of them do to some degree. Um, okay. So my, um, so I have, uh, I have five kids. I have three biological children, and then we have, um, we adopted um, two teenagers um, three years ago. So, um, and I taught them all how to fly fish with tenkara rods. 
my biological children have been fishing with tenkara rods since they were like four or five. So um, it's been it's been a part of their life as far as they can recall. Um, so yeah, and they don't. None of them are like my my son will. My son will pretty much if I ask him if he wants to go fishing, he'll go with me pretty much every time. Um, none of them are super serious about it, but they all know how to do it. They've all caught fish doing it. We've, you know, I've had fun with all of them, um, fly fishing with Tenkara. That's awesome. Passing it down to the next generation. That's all yeah. they ask for. And then, you know, they'll, they'll go with it or not, I guess. Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Maybe yeah. when they're older, they'll be like, Oh dad, let's, let's go, let's go, let's go fish, you know? And if not, that's okay. We had, we had some good times doing it together. Sure. Sure. Um, so now that I guess, you know, Badger um, has, you've moved on from Badger, both of you guys have moved on from Badger. What is your, you know, if you want to call it your Tenkara life or Tenkara path, what does that look like these days? Yeah. So um, it's kind of reverted to what it was before. And, you know, big thing that's different is Matt's not here anymore. Um, so, you know, Matt's out in Colorado now. So he, my number one fishing buddy is, uh, uh, not around. So I fish with by myself a lot more, uh, which is fine. I enjoy fishing by myself, but yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of like, uh, a lot of it is finding time in the margins around work and family life to escape and fish a Creek for an hour or two. And, um, you know, occasionally getting that, uh, hall pass, as they say, to get a day away to fish, which, uh, right. you know, uh, my wife is very gracious about. Um, but yeah, it's like I said, I, you know, come, Come January, if it's day off and it's nice outside, it's, you know, above about 20 degrees and not too windy, I'll try to get out and fish. And um, once it warms up, it's smallmouth all the time. And then it's back to trout in the fall. So uh, besides uh, Wisconsin and, and Iowa driftless trout streams, uh, is there a, a, a trout fishery or place uh, outside of the Midwest uh, that has really captured your imagination or a, a, a bucket list uh, that you're, you've kind of got your eye on as far as some place outside of your normal that you'd like to fish? I mean, I suppose there should be, um, but I, I just not, I'm not super aspirational about that. Like, you know, I've never fished Montana. I should, you know, I should probably, <laughs> you know, that's a thing people do. You know, I see some of these like videos of New Zealand. Well, that looks pretty awesome. Maybe I would like to do that sometime. But, you know, I'm just, I'm just so content, you know, with the fisheries we have here. I am perfectly happy with them. We're, we're just blessed with abundance of opportunities here in Wisconsin. And I'm good. It's, it's, it's exciting for me. And when I have traveled to fish, it's been fun and I like it. But it's like, man, yeah, also really like fishing where I am. Got it. Yeah. Do you, do you have a favorite species of fish? It's yeah, to... it's smallmouth. Um, yeah, with brook trout being a close second, like I, I love brook trout. I mean, they're they're just they're just beautiful fish. Um, you know, I do occasionally. I eat I eat a couple fish every year, and they're usually brook trout because they're delicious. I mean, they're like tiny salmon. I know that's going to upset some people, but it's done in a sustainable way. You know, me taking one or two fish a year isn't going to hurt the fishery. Um, so brook trout are spectacular and I love the places that brook trout live. They tend to be very beautiful. Um, some of our prettiest streams here in Wisconsin are brook trout streams. Um, but, uh, smallmouth are, are just the aggression, um, of a smallmouth. Yeah. You nail your fly, the fight of a smallmouth. Um, I mean, just pound for pound, there's really nothing else like it. Cool. Well, then I think what we'll probably do now is I have a couple of quick hit questions that I like to ask people at the end of every interview. Um, so maybe we'll go through those. You can answer as long or as short as you'd like. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to go through them a little, little bit quick. So the first one I have is, do you have any hobbies or pursuits outside of fishing? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> So that changes. I mean, I'm kind of one of those ADHD personalities who's tried out a lot of different things and I've stuck with Tenkara for like 10 years. That's a long time for me. Um, but my current thing is I've been, um, I play guitar badly and uh, I've also been into like trying to find people that are just basically selling their guitars for next to, next to nothing and then cleaning them up, fixing them up and then flipping them. And that's been sort of since COVID hit and, you know, not doing as much outside the house. That's been my preoccupation is finding deals and then cleaning them up and fixing them and then flipping them. And that's been, it's, it's been weird to have a hobby that I make money with and I'm not making really any significant money, 
but it, it's like a hobby where I'm not actually losing money, which is very unusual for me. It's, it's well, other than the, the yacht that we bought with the Badger Tinkara money yes, and, and the private <laughs> island and the limo, you know. <laughs> with our capitalist money-making scheme, yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> do you end up keeping many? You say you flip them. Uh, yeah. Keeping too many, do you find? I do, yeah. I mean, you know, my kids ask me, how many guitars do you have, Dad? And I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, it just gets to the point where I'm like, okay, I have like, you know, I have a couple hangers on the wall and a couple stands and then a little room in a closet for them. And if they're not all fitting, it's time to start getting rid of some. Yeah, I understand. So, Same way yeah. with your odds. Um, yeah. <laughs> Next question. What is the most um, unusual or impressive natural world thing you've encountered while fishing? Oh, my gosh. Uh, there are so many. And I have to say, that's just one of the things that um, I really love about, uh, about fishing is you just experience all these things that you wouldn't have otherwise. I guess I'm going to go with two. Um, okay. One was uh, on the Wisconsin River. Um, seeing a great blue heron um catch a bowfin that was like as long as it was and then basically flip it up into the air and swallow that thing in one gulp and then <laughs> and i just thought how on earth can that bird you know swallow that fish it's almost as big as it is and we were drifting and we were trying to like keep our distance so we didn't disturb it and then obviously it got bothered that we were too close to it it got up and flew away and i just thought how can that bird even fly? Uh, <laughs> it's probably like 10 times heavier than it normally is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, the monkey induced feeding frenzy of Machaca was a good one. Um, but then, you know, this is one of my favorite things. And I love it when this stuff happens. I was fishing with a buddy and he had a little, we were on a fairly small creek and he had a little eight inch brown uh, on the line. And this, you know, 22, 23 inch brown trout comes out from the depth of the pool and eats the eight inch brown that he had on the line. And he wasn't, you know, he's like hooting and hollering about it. So I run over there and was trying to net it for him and actually fell into the hole trying to net the fish for him. But I managed to like grab both fish uh, in the net. And so we got photos with both of the fish that uh, uh, he had on the line at that point. So that, that was pretty cool. Like I always like that when a bigger fish eats the smaller fish you have on the line, mm -hmm. actually able to be able to land them is pretty rare. Yeah, no kidding, no kidding. So I have to ask, um, yeah. I don't know if they're in Wisconsin, but do you, have you ever seen a Bigfoot? <laughs> No, seen some weird things, but I've never seen a Bigfoot, to okay. my knowledge. So. Okay, okay. Well, maybe I recall there out. was there was significant Sasquatch lore surrounding the summer camp that uh, that we used to go to uh, as a kid. Uh, there was a, a cave. It wasn't even a cave. It was like a little collapse yeah. uh, that supposedly the Sasquatch lived in. But uh, might have been a rumor. Might, Might have been. Have been. Well, I, I, know, I, I know the last time I was in, in Wisconsin to do some fishing, I saw a Tenkara Gandalf. Um, <laughs> but but um, so there may be a Bigfoot out there. We just haven't. We, we, we don't know. Yeah, we yeah. oh, there may be some kind of final battle in the works. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm sitting a Hollywood blockbuster right now. <laughs> All right. Two more questions. Um, are, are there any uh, conservation initiatives that you support or would like to mention? Yeah. So um, I'm a life member of Trout Unlimited, and uh, I have also um, donated um, my time and some cash to Project Green Team, um, which is a, a local uh, organization that uh, introduces kids from disadvantaged backgrounds into fly fishing. So I volunteered some of my time with, I haven't done that for a couple of years because it's pretty complicated having five teenagers in your house. Um, but that's something that I, I really support is, you know, giving, giving teens uh, who may not have the opportunity otherwise to get out and experience what we, we maybe take for granted the opportunity to go out and fish. Got it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, last question I have, do you have any advice for a new or novice Tenkara angler? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just go do it. Um, don't worry about if you're doing it right. Don't worry about what people tell you, um, you know, you should or should not do online. Like if it works, you're doing it right. If it doesn't work, 
try something else. Uh, so yeah, just get out there, get out there and experience it. You're going to find your own groove uh, and make the best of the time you have outside. Uh, is there anything that uh, we didn't ask you that you'd, you'd like to add? Um, what do you think, Matt? At what point did you just decide, you know, forget it. I'm going to become a hippie and just grow my hair out again. Because honestly, like, I don't, I don't remember it being this long when we were kids. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, that was uh, probably close to two years ago. Uh, I this was always like a short hair guy because I thought it looked professional. You know, I thought I had to show up to work and look professional. But turns out people like long haired doctors. Um, but my wife said to me, you know, you're lucky you still have hair. Maybe you should try growing it up. <laughs> <laughs> right on. I love it. I love it. Well, they make they make that uh, that that horse tail and mane shampoo. If you ever <laughs> give it that extra luster, I'm trying. Yeah, I, I, I have not. my own COVID head of hair myself. Yeah, you definitely have a COVID hair going. I like yeah. I like that look. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I think that's pretty much all I have. If you don't have anything else, Matt. Um, I just like that's to it. thank you, um, <laughs> Mike, for for joining us today and uh, talking a little ten car and fixed line. Thanks, guys. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for Thanks. coming, Mike. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right. See you, dudes. All right. All right. Bye, guys. <laughs>